Great. I'll give it right back to you. Yeah. Here you go, please. Oh, great. Thank you. Where are you putting this? It's on the Save USC page's oh, Facebook page. Oh, oh okay. Do you want to start, Eric? Mm -hmm. All right, good. Well, thank you very much for coming this morning. And uh, what I'd like to do is uh, give a brief introduction and uh, discuss uh, the three executive orders that uh, President Trump recently issued and their impact on federal employees and more importantly on the Save the US EPA campaign. Uh, we all are aware of the scandals that are occurring almost daily with uh, Mr. Pruitt and his family and that certainly is disgusting but uh, that aside uh, we're here to try to save the federal workforce and in particular to save the US EPA to make sure that human health and the environment are protected. So without further uh, ado, I'd just like to open it up for questions and, and see if I can answer your questions as best I can. Well, so there are some numbers when it comes to folks that have left the EPA. I think mm -hmm. the latest ones I saw were from the end of December 2017 and around yes. over 800. Is there an updated number? Uh, there isn't, but I can tell you that our, our workforce numbers have gone from 18,110 in 1999 down to the last reported figure was 14,140. Uh, yet we know that number one, there's been no new hires, and number two, there has been attrition. People have been retiring to get out of the agency, to get out of this toxic environment. So I would not be surprised if that number is below 14,000 now. Now the other thing I did learn uh, just recently was that when we had the 19, 000, excuse me, the 18,110 employees, we also had a lot of contractors and what they call C employees, um, senior environmental uh, employees. And uh, the total number of people working at the agency was closer to 24,000. Today we have somewhere around 14,000 without all those uh, additional people working. So we're really down potentially 10,000 people in the workforce. Can you just clarify when the 14,140 number I heard that uh, just early this year, 2018. Uh, we haven't heard anything from this administration since. They've been very uh, close to the chest on most about it, uh, mostly everything, especially staffing and, and budget. So I guess I would just throw out, uh, you know, what, what's the morale like right now at the EPA? Obviously, it's been a tough time for many people, and given stories keep coming out, including today with uh, uh, about Mr. Pruitt, um, you know, what, what is the impact uh, inside the agency? Do you, do you see, uh, you know, how, how is it uh, not just impacting employee morale, but their work, their work product? Is, is it having big effects? I do believe it is. I mean, first of all, uh, people are disgusted. Uh, they're disgusted that the administrator of the agency, someone who we should all be able to look up to and follow in a leadership manner, um, he is uh, almost daily doing something uh, that would get any one of us fired. Uh, but secondly, I think people are so disgusted with the, uh, the bad rhetoric that's coming out of uh, some of the right-wing media as well as out of certain areas of Congress um, that somehow we're uh, not worth the effort to keep on board, that we're not worth pay raises. They want to go after our retirements. They want to go after our civil service protections. In essence, what I think this administration wants to do is go back to the days, if they can get there, of pre-Pendleton Act in 1881. Um, and not to throw out a, a law at you, but basically in the good old days, when a Republican came into office, he would sweep out all the Democrats from the uh, jobs in federal government, and vice versa, when a Democrat came in, they would sweep everybody out. And the idea was, no, we need a professional cadre of um, EPA employees, for example, or uh, DOJ employees, whatever agency it is that, is that is day in and day out doing the work of the agency. So morale is not good. If you want a, if you want a little um, uh, funny way of looking at it, it's so low you need a gutter. You need a ladder to get out of the gutter. And in, in Chicago, a gutter is on the street, not on the <laughs> roof. Uh, two questions. Yes, I, was wondering if you, I was wondering if you could just walk through the effect of some of the executive orders you're talking sure. about, but also at a budget question, are you heartened at all by the fact that the Senate 
while not plussing up EPA's budget, is showing signs of not, maybe not cutting it? Uh, uh, I'm not even cautiously optimistic. Uh, and here's the reason, because I'd like to see the EPM numbers, the Environmental Program Management numbers. Those are the numbers that actually pay for the, uh, the staff levels. Um, we were able to avert a potential disaster uh, this year by having the $79 million removed from the budget for potential buyouts. That would have meant as many as 2,000, 2,200 people leaving the agency. And believe me, they would leave the agency given the toxic environment. Um, what the, uh, the executive orders really get at, uh, first of all, they're unconstitutional. Uh, the union's right is the same as the right of the free press, and that comes from the First Amendment. And uh, we have uh, the right to speak out on behalf of the employees about working conditions, and we consider the direction of our agency and its staffing and budget levels to be one of the premier working conditions that we should be concerned about. So the executive order, uh, one is targeting official time, which is in a statute that was passed by Congress back in 1978. So the administration is trying to uh, exert its influence on the legislative uh, sector. Uh, another one is on facilities that we use to conduct our business. And the third one is going after the civil service protections that ultimately came from over 100 years ago from the Pendleton Act and have just since grown. And so we will have a workforce, if Mr. Trump uh, gets his way, that has no protections, that has no voice, and that they can fire at will. And uh, then he would get people to do exactly what he wants, which is not protect the environment, not protect human health. Can you uh, talk about, at the region level, are there some are there employees in some regions that are more optimistic or less concerned than they are, let's say, in the Chicago Region 5 office or some well, employees doing better in other, other regions? Than we've, we've had um, a training session going on this week in Washington, and we have uh, most of our locals here in D.C., and so we've had a number of discussions about the executive orders and about the budget. And um, with rare exception, um, the agency is pushing the local regional offices and the, uh, for example, the Office of Research and Development facilities to implement these executive orders even before they're uh, in full force and effect. They've already demanded the bargain to reopen our contracts, our local agreements. Uh, they want to make sure that we have no more than 25% of our time used for uh, official time. So even if management and, and the union want to get together and discuss a workplace condition and resolve it in a fair and equitable manner, that would take away from our official time. We're not allowed to represent essentially employees on our official time anymore. And yet there's literally hundreds and hundreds of people that work for the agency that work specifically to um, discipline employees and uh, go after employees. And those aren't supervisors, those are all labor and employee relations people. Did I answer your question? Yeah. So, um, so you're wondering if there's another region. Um, I don't think so. I think the, uh, the proverbial matter is hitting the fan just about everywhere. everywhere. They're, in Denver, they, they claim that they so far have had uh, pushback from their um, LER, their labor and employee relations group, but I don't think that's going to last very long at all. But beyond the, what uh, Trump is trying to do to the to the unions, uh, what is morale? How does that uh, uh, how does that compare from uh, region to region? Um, there are some relatively decent regional administrators. Would you say that compared to maybe uh, Kathy Stepp in Region Five? Who there there are some that are worse than others. <laughs> Let me put it that way. Um, they're all put in place, and you have to remember what's the game plan. The game plan goes back to the. January 2017 CPAC meeting in which uh, uh, Mr. Banyan basically laid out the administration's uh, goal and that was to um, deconstruct the administrative state. And that's what Scott Pruitt is doing, that's what Mr. Zinke is doing, uh, and that hasn't changed. 
So what, what worries you the most in terms of the impact on certain programs, obviously climate, but things like Superfund? I mean, some of the things that Scott Pruitt has talked about, changing policy and having dramatic impacts, uh, what, what, what worries you the most? Well, if you want to destroy an agency, one of the best ways to destroy that agency is to starve it of funds and starve it of people. So I'll give you an example. Uh, during the Iraq uh, and Afghanistan wars, uh, we had more and more wounded warriors coming back from battle. And what did the Bush administration do in the Republican Congress? They cut the VA budget. And then you can say, oh, look, the VA doesn't work. We need to privatize it. And I think that same sort of attitude prevails in this administration. They're going to try to do the same with the US EPA. And then the next step would be, let's let the states do everything. And then you're putting it into a realm where the plant manager in Kokomo, Indiana, can call up the governor and say, hey, get these uh, EPA people off my back. Um, and that's going to be a disaster. Can, can you give us an example? I mean, what, what a specific program that's been impacted that way, you know, in terms of budget cutting uh, and, and impact. Yeah, I understand, for example, uh, there's been some memos from uh, Susan Bodine that uh, indicate uh, that she will personally review anything that's going to be referred to DOJ for enforcement action. And you have to understand that when the agency refers something to DOJ, DOJ pretty much requires that case to be a 150% chance of winning. Uh, they don't take chances. So now Susan Bodine is going to review those cases and then most likely act as a gatekeeper as to what goes on for uh, prosecution. Um, and the other thing is uh, that there have been instances where people have developed penalty calculations under it could be the RICRA program or water program, you name the program, and they've been called up to regional administrators offices. And this happened in Philadelphia in uh, Region 3 where they were told to recalculate, that it's much too high, what are you trying to do, put this company out of business? You know, that kind of thing, so. And that was in Region 3? Region 3, Philadelphia, yeah. <clears throat> what are your views on Andrew Wheeler? Let's say Trump does finally mm -hmm. decide to get rid of Scott Pruitt, would uh, Wheeler be an improvement or I mean, there may be fewer scandals under Wheeler since he's more of a Washington insider, but he seems like he might be just as bad on the environment. I think there would be probably, as you say, fewer scandals, mm -hmm. but he's a uh, more adept at being able to navigate the uh, ins and outs of the agency and Congress. And we have to remember that his heart is in lobbying for fossil fuels, and uh, he's not going to promote any kind of decent climate change. Um, work by the agency, and that is a problem. Um, you know, just talk to those people in the uh, Pacific Islands that are slowly losing their countries because they're going underwater. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Um, Did I answer your question? Yes, sir. No yes, sir. I, I didn't mean to cut no, off. Sir. I'm, I'm just curious, sort of, someone who you know, we all watch the EPA, and what does it do to morale every time? Every time there's a new scandal about Chick-fil-A or used mattresses or lotion? Well, it's, it's kind of like you can't make this stuff up. Uh, in fact, one of our local presidents uses that when he sends out these sorts of things. Um, it's discouraging that the person that's supposed to be leading the agency that is dedicated to protecting human health and the environment um, is um, a person that apparently lacks basic ethical values and he is making a laughing stock out of his own party, as far as I'm concerned, and certainly out of this country. Um, uh, news is worldwide, I and mean, I just can imagine what they think in, uh, in Europe and uh, places like Ireland. Um, it's, it's a joke. Um, what does it do to us? Same thing. It's like, this is the person they put in place. What are their intentions? We know what their intentions are when you put somebody like Scott Pruitt in place. Yes, Doug. Hi, just wanted to ask a question about, you know, there's been talk about an upcoming reorganization plan from the federal government, uh, you know, uh, soon. Um, how, do we know anything about what that could mean for EPA, and how, how concerned are you that that could lead to further changes at, at EPA? Well, I'm always concerned about any reorganization because the principle behind it should be, number one, to maintain the mission of the agency, and number two, 
if you're going to change an organization, you need to change it based on a workload workforce analysis. And if you want to see documents, just check out the US EPA Office of Inspector General or the Government Accountability Office. They've been reporting on this for years and years. EPA has not done a workload workforce analysis at least in 20 years. So if they're going to reorganize, what's their basis for the reorganization? Can they show us um, how many people they truly need in air enforcement, in air permitting, in water enforcement, water permitting? And can they show us for sure how any reorganization will actually benefit the American people? Uh, that should be the, the foundation. Uh, if, absent that, I don't think that organization would be uh, worth considering. Uh, yes? Uh, can you talk about the leaner process? I know that that has started under Obama, but it seems like the current administration has embraced it. So what changes have been made, and if there's anything that's worrisome or not? Sure. Well, uh, LEAN, of course, stands for Less Employees Are Needed, and I believe that that's the entire point of that program. They're going to look at processes, and again, you have to remember the agency could have done this at any point in time. We had, in the past, we had high-performing organization training. We had TQM. Uh, LEAN is kind of like TQM on steroids, um, but I believe that they're looking at it from the standpoint of how can we... Um, rationalize fewer employees at EPA, not how can we make the agency a better place in terms of working or in terms of um, satisfying the American people. They talk about customers, but those customers they talk about are uh, appear to be industry and the permitted community. Uh, they don't seem to pay any attention to the child with asthma or the elderly people with COPD or uh, the most um, people that are most vulnerable in our society. Yes? Um, have you heard about any cases of intimidation or retaliation against EPA employees who have attended rallies? I, I covered that rally outside of EPA headquarters a month or two. Um, I heard that there were um, some employees said that they were told not to go to that rally. Uh, have you heard any cases about retaliation? Well, I talked with Nate James, uh, the president of that local, and uh, he did indicate that he had more people from other organizations than from his own local. And uh, people are afraid. And I'll give you another example. There was a, a young lady I was speaking to just the other day from Research Triangle Park, who is a union officer. And uh, she indicated that she doesn't want to talk to the press. And we said, well, why would you have that kind of an opinion? Well, I don't want to lose my job. And this is a person that works for the union who is protected by statute. Um, so I am concerned about that. I'm concerned about uh, the intimidation that's being done even uh, amongst some of the union folks so that they're afraid to speak out. If they don't speak out, who will? Yes, sir. Has the mood changed since a lot of the Pruitt, like political well, associates, got, have, since they've gone back to Oklahoma or left, like Dravis or? No, I don't think so. I think what, what is really the, the case is that um, right now we have all the Pruitt appointees in place for the most part in the regional offices, and they will begin doing their, their work. Uh, I did hear, and this is hearsay, so I, I don't know how good it is, but um, apparently Kathy Stepp had a uh, meeting with her senior leadership team, so this would be the Air Division Director, Water Division, and so on, and indicated to them that uh, uh, Mr. Pruitt and D.C. have indicated that if they don't tamp down the noise coming from Chicago, there will be consequences. Now, is that true? I believe it's true, but I can't prove it. I wasn't there. So um, probably the most scandalous uh, administration of all time was the Ann Burford uh, administration uh, during the Reagan administration. Uh, I don't know, were you actually in, okay, so comparing what happened then and what happened today, I mean, how would you just generally compare the two administrations and, uh, you know, what, what do you think is, uh, uh, where do you think this administration is going? Well, under, under Ann Gorsuch Burford, who we nicknamed the Ice Queen, uh, she was uh, a real piece of work. Her son is now on the Supreme Court. Um, Rita Lavelle went to jail, we all know that, for lying. Um, but uh, eventually, uh, Reagan appointed uh, Mr. Ruckelshaus again to be administrator, who's a decent man. I would love to see uh, a 
that type of person return. Unfortunately, he's too old now. He's indicated he wouldn't even uh, consider it. Um, what's going to happen, A, if they keep Scott Pruitt in place, or B, if they get rid of him? Are they going to put in a, a William Ruckelshaus? I don't think so. I think this is a an administration that truly is set to carry out the Heritage Foundation's uh, desires and wishes, and those of the uh, the elite on the right hand side, uh, the Koch brothers, and so on. And I I just ask myself, don't these people have children? Don't they have grandchildren? Don't they care about other people at all? But in terms of corruption, do you see the same level of corruption in this administration as, as occurred during Gorsuch? I think ultimately it's going to be worse. Uh, I don't think, uh, I think Ann, will, Ann Gorsuch Burford will always be um, someone we write about in a negative fashion, but I think Mr. Pruitt is going to top her agenda. And no matter what he does, he seems to survive. Uh, we even hear some uh, key Republicans talking about it, but they never do anything about it. So I anticipate he may be in office for a while yet. Mm -hmm. Yes? Kind of following up on the worker intimidation mm -hmm. question, can you offer any examples or shed any more light on what that might look like in terms of could there be memos that are sent out, or is it coming down or is it just more people just watching the press and you know hearing political talk yeah. elsewhere? Yeah, you won't you won't see any memos uh, to that effect. They're too smart for that, and they are smart. You have to you have to acknowledge that they they planned this, they they executed, they have a lot of discipline. Uh, no, it's more one on one discussions and, uh, <coughs> and people toe the line, and uh, as they if one of these executive orders goes through, the one that chips away at the uh, merit systems protections, and if they uh, shackle the unions from defending those people, then you'll see that escalate. What, I mean, what restrictions are you personally gonna experience under, I mean, the official time order is very detailed, like 25% staff, like are you, you're full time, yes. official time. Yes. So does that mean only you're gonna work 25% of the time? Uh, I think there's also another restriction in there, like you get one hour official time per uh, bargaining unit representative. So yes. I mean, you're at eight thousand. So you got yes. you're not limited there, but there's smaller unions that will be limited by that. There's unions in EPA that have 200, 300 employees. Um, you're going to have to pay rent. You've got an office mm -hmm. in Chicago. Mm -hmm. People have offices elsewhere. I mean, like, are you going to be able to talk to the press? Are we going to be seeing you next year? You know? <laughs> what yeah, is going to be going I, on? I, I, and I, was, I know AFGE yeah. and NTAU yeah. have filed lawsuits, right. and uh, you you believe they're going to win, but, you know. Uh, hopefully they'll win. We don't know if they're going to yeah. win. They, what they want is a temporary restraining order, but you have to understand it from this standpoint. So the, the administration does something that's uh, unconstitutional. Well, who cares? You have to take them to court. You have to go to the ju judicial branch and fight it out, and that could take not weeks, but months and years. And so in the interim, uh, they've already demanded to bargain on our official time, on our space, and on the uh, disciplinary uh, events. Um, and there's gonna be another one coming out shortly, uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But um, they're gonna go ahead and take that away from us, um, hurt the union, shackle the union, shut the employees up. So what if we win four years from now in court? They won. Um, now the, yes, sir. Oh, sorry. Well, the next one that they we anticipate them coming out with is uh, to follow the Scott Walker governor of Wisconsin lead and take away dues deduction. Everybody goes, oh my God, why are you worried about that? Well, um, you have to remember that any federal employee has the right to take out at least ten different withholdings from his pay. It could be for insurance. It could be for. Um, something that he or she bought, uh, and it can also be for union dues. And uh, they want to just specifically take away union dues, not everything else. Uh, the same with the space. Other organizations such, uh, for example, the Federal Credit Union does not pay rent in federal buildings. So we're not gonna focus on them, we're just gonna focus on the union. If uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield or one of the health providers comes in, they get free space. Uh, we're not gonna focus on them, just the unions. So it's not the fact that we're gonna have to suddenly, oh my, 
pay rent, but it's the, the laser focus on the unions. And why are they going after the unions? Because we're the ones that stand up for the employees. Did I answer your question? <laughs> How yes, long before the EPA looks the way it did on, let's say, uh, you know, January 19th, 2017? In, in other words, how long before you get back to the kind of operation you had? Well, you have to remember that this administration still has, what, two and a half years to go? And they're just beginning to start uh, the real attacks on the unions. And uh, they've tried twice now in their budget proposals, 2018, 2019 to cut the agency, but then you have to also look back at what the agency's budget was, say in the 70s, and convert it to uh, current dollars. And if you do that, you find that some of the budgets in the 70s were at the $14 billion level. And so here we are at what, $8 billion? And we're saying, oh, we saved the agency, $8 billion. No, we should be at $14 billion or something, if we truly wanted to do the job of the American people. But there are a lot of programs that are not being done. And a lot of things that aren't being provided to states, for example, in terms of support. So how long? Uh, it depends on how, how well they ruin the agency. It could be, it could take the next administration, if that administration is, is uh, pro-EPA, could take them four years to rebuild it. And maybe a lot of the experienced, dedicated staff might have left. So now you gotta redevelop staff. It takes a while to learn a job. I was in Superfund as a remedial project manager, so cleaning up Superfund sites. And I believe it took me about three years to really get comfortable and, and know that job without needing to consult with too many people. So it'll take a while. I have a question about Scott Pruitt. Um, he's getting a lot of press, right? Um, and you're obviously confronting a lot of challenges in the Trump administration. Is there any sense in which the fact that he is, is there and undergoing these ethics issues helping you get your message out to the broader public? Do you, do you see it having an effect or, or not? I would hope it has an effect. I would hope people at home are asking why we are spending good taxpayer dollars on a person that acts this way, and in particular that's supposed to be protecting my child who has asthma or my child who has a uh, disability or um, who's cleaning up my Superfund site, that sort of thing. And, and let me just go to Superfund for a minute. You know, they, they've come up with 25 Superfund sites, um, and there's a little over 1,300 <coughs> in the national priorities list. Well, that's not the whole story. There's really many, many more thousand than those 1,300. Uh, because in the 90s, the agency began to require, essentially, the governor of a state to agree to listing a site on the NPL, and a lot of uh, uh, governors did not want to have another NPL site. The reason for listing at the NPL was uh, when we used to have money, when we used to have the super fund, we could go out and clean up a site and then go after the responsible parties. But since that super fund dried up uh, shortly after 95, then we have to go out and find the PRBs, sue them, litigate, get them into a group and get them to agree to do a work plan, a feasibility study, um, and then to do some proposals, and then uh, ultimately to clean up the site. And that takes years, and that's one, one of the things that's causing Superfund sites to take so long. Yes? Um, so in the beginning I had asked about how the staff numbers were changing. And mm -hmm. you mentioned that it wasn't just staff, but that there's this larger workforce yes. that includes contractors. Yes. Can you talk at all about how the relationships with contractors have changed, or if there's any examples where you are using them less, or maybe you're relying on them more because internal staff is uh, Well, one of the um, interesting stories about um, contractors, for example, in Chicago, in, in Region 5, uh, we have a contractor who handles our three help desks for computers. And uh, they're always rebidding that contract and getting a new contractor in, and the people never change. They just get paid less. So um, I'm not sure that's very effective. But um, we don't have as many contract dollars. We don't have as many contractors assisting us on certain areas. We used to hire them, for example, in the 80s uh, and, early, and late 70s, we hired a lot of contractors to do studies on certain industries, like the steel industry or the leather tanning industry. 
and develop reports in terms of pollutants that are discharged from them and what kind of technologies might effectively treat those pollutants. And that would help us in terms of our uh, rulemaking and our permitting. Uh, we don't have that kind of resource anymore. Is that something that specifically disappeared under the Pruitt administration, or oh, that's slowly been, been disappearing? That's been for a slowly long time. disappearing. Um, but you have to remember that under the Obama administration, we shrunk down to 15,000. But why? Because the Republican Congress said we they were not going to fund us at any higher level than 15,000. And unfortunately, the Obama administration did not fight very strongly for that, uh, for a, a stronger EPA. It's unfortunate. So it's not an attempt to hire more contractors instead of permanent employees, like you know, so maybe another way to get at the union? Um, I, I think really they want to go after the union. I don't think they, they're going to be able to effectively replace us with contract employees to do the work, but I think this is going to be a scenario. They talk about um, uh, cooperative federalism 2.0. And the fact is, number one, we've been doing cooperative federalism for years. We work as partners with the states, tribal authorities, and municipalities. But um, this administration talks out of it, both sides of its mouth. On one hand, it says they want to do cooperative federalism. On the second hand, they're cutting not only EPA staff, but they're cutting the money that goes to the states. 65% of our funding that EPA receives passes through <coughs> the states, tribal authorities, and municipalities. So when you're cutting not only the EPA employees who assist the states, but the funding going to the states, um, you're, you're not protecting the environment. Uh, you're just simply getting uh, getting the EPA to kind of go away quietly. So 65 percent of your funding <coughs> budget goes to state programs. Basically. States, tribal authorities, and municipalities. Yes, that's been the case for years. So, and that makes it even more important when you look at a budget and the Senate or the House limits the EPM dollars. Those are the part of the 35% that's left that actually funds staffing. That's the important thing. Yes, ma'am. Any insight into Ford's legal defense fund? Uh, when he was on the Hill, there were questions about whether, you know, sort of where the money would come from. Right. Haven't heard anything since. Well, let me ask a question. Why does he need a legal defense fund? What is he doing wrong? Why is he doing wrong things? Why haven't other re, uh, EPA administrators have had to have a legal defense fund? Because they weren't acting the way Mr. Pruitt is acting. It's, it's really reprehensible that he can act that way and then have uh, industry donors essentially give him money to defend himself. Um, he shouldn't be acting this way. He shouldn't need a legal defense fund. And if he has one, he ought to get out. Do you have any memory of any EPA administrator ever having a legal defense fund? I do not. Uh, yeah. When, John, when did you join EPA again? It was like 19, I forget. In 81, I was a, a contractor to, to EPA in the yeah. good old days when we were considered almost employees, uh, which was incorrect on the part of the agency, but then in 84, I actually joined as a federal employee. And Gorsuch never, Gorsuch Buford never had, or Buford Gorsuch, I can never remember which one goes first. I don't think she had a legal defense fund. I don't believe she did. Yeah. I guess one question, I, you've met, you took over AFG Council 238 in 2016, correct? Yes. yes. And did you, I don't think you had a chance to meet Gina McCarthy before I, she I met Gina McCarthy when she, Gina. yeah, she came to, uh, Chicago. Okay. And if you, I mean, Administrator Pruitt's been to Chicago, have you, have you met him? Um, no. Been Administrator Pruitt has been to Boston, Chicago, uh, Denver, and maybe Dallas, but yeah. he doesn't meet with employees. He just goes straight to the regional administrator's floor, and he might accidentally meet somebody on the way to the men's room. That's, that's about the extent of his involvement with employees. But you haven't met with him yet? No. Okay. Why would he want to meet with me? Because prior administrators <laughs> met with you. I might tell him he's You're the head things. of the lar yeah. EPA's largest. He, he doesn't care. He doesn't care. Yeah. Yes? Uh, you talked about the Obama administration not fighting hard enough for EPA funds. And then you also refer to William Reckleshouse being a good uh, replacement for Ann Gorsuch. In your time there, who, who would you say has been the strongest EPA administrator? I mean, was it someone in the... 
first Bush administration, or was it someone in the Clinton or Obama administration? Was it uh, was it Gina uh, McCarthy or somebody? I think Gina McCarthy did a good job of bringing uh, climate change to the forefront, and that certainly mm -hmm. I think was her strong point. Um, but I would say that uh, Ruckelshaus was probably the best ever. Um, it doesn't matter what party a person is, he had his heart in the right place and he knew how to get things done and he didn't uh, sell the, uh, the agency short. Another great regional administrator, um, not an administrator, but a regional administrator who survived whether uh, it was a Democrat or Republican administration was uh, Valadantes. And he worked in Chicago for years. Later he left and went back and became president of Lithuania. He was exceptional. Um, he uh, stood up uh, to Congress and he just said the truth. And uh, he also was great on enforcement. He uh, cared about the environment and he got things done. So I don't care what party they are. Just, I, I just want them to do the job they're, they're assigned to do. That they, they take on that job, they take an oath of office, well then now fulfill that oath. Um, you mentioned climate change. Uh, clearly there's been an abrupt shift in, in uh, policy here, uh, you know, what, what has been the impact internally in terms of climate change programs at EPA, obviously the word climate change is almost never used, um, but more in, in a larger picture, you know, in terms of people's health, their children, this is arguably the biggest uh, threat, global threat in history. Uh, this agency is the, the, the spearhead of, of, uh, of a climate change policy. Um, what what has been the the, the, the impact on, on the agency in terms of who its position on this? Well, the longer you tamp down uh, the agency and engineers and scientists from doing their jobs addressing climate change, um, they're going to eventually uh, find other work to do. Maybe they'll go to universities. Maybe they'll just retire if they're eligible. Um, but you begin to lose that expertise, and you begin to also lose that momentum. And uh, it, it's, it's a sad, sad case because climate change is the number one issue worldwide today. And people are still arguing whether or not carbon dioxide is a uh, greenhouse gas. I mean, give me a break. Um, if you think of it, you know, if people would just think of climate change uh, like the microwave in their house, seriously. You put a, put a, a cup of tea or a cup of water or whatever it is, or a, a piece of meat, in the microwave. How does it heat up? It heats up because the microwaves cause the uh, water molecules to vibrate, essentially to cause friction, cause heat. The same thing the sun does to the global, to, to the greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. They get all excited, they cause friction, they bounce against each other, it heats up. We're at the point where our uh, CO2 levels are above 400 ppm. They're growing. We're not reducing the, the amount of carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide, yes, is absorbed by trees, but we're cutting trees down at an alarming rate. It's absorbed by the ocean, and guess what? The ocean is acidifying as a result, and we're losing um, coral reefs as a result. The Great Barrier Reef in Australia uh, is suffering damage from climate change. Uh, we have certain islands in the Pacific that are basically losing their countries because they're being inundated with water. The Defense Department, until just recently, considered climate change one of the uh, strategic concerns they had uh, because they know when the uh, growing seasons are impacted, when um, water, when droughts become reality, etc., that people are going to leave their country across the border, and that's going to cause problems between countries. Um, but, but we have a bunch of people in Congress that uh, apparently care more about the people that pay them money than, than the facts. But are budget cuts being targeted towards climate change programs? Um, At EPA? I don't have the exact figures, but let me ask you a question in reverse. Do you see climate change work being done by the agency? That's the whole story right there. So they. They might be uh, continuing to do a little bit, but they're not aggressively going out there working on uh, climate change and, and answers. Uh, they're trying to get rid of the uh, clean power plant. I mean, it's, it's going the wrong direction.
That is super fun. I've written a couple articles about that small town called Menden in West Virginia. The residents there are actually optimistic that the Pruitt administration will actually uh, declare, place it on the national priorities list, maybe sometime this fall. That may be in jeopardy now that Cal Kelly, I guess, uh, has, has left the uh, EPA. Do you think uh, Scott Pruitt is picking various uh, sites based on politics, based on the states that voted for Trump? Uh, um, and is that necessarily a bad thing if it does help these well, people? <laughs> well, I'm all in favor of cleaning up any Superfund yeah. site, but if you really wanted to do something in the Superfund, you would go to Congress and tell them the truth, that the agency is grossly underfunded to clean up these sites. We don't have the money to clean up the sites. We don't have the people to effectively enforce the law and get PRPs together to clean up the sites. So picking 25 off the list, whether they're um, from politically uh, uh, correct states or because it's an easy target that can be easily cleaned up. Uh, there's sites, uh, for example, one in, I believe, Montana that could probably absorb the entire EPA budget on Superfund and then some just to clean it up. You know, let's, let's get real about it. Let's put some money and some people in it. And then remember, 1,300 sites in the NPL. That's not the story. There's really thousands upon thousands that are NPL caliber that aren't getting cleaned up. Could you give us a sense, I know you're talking to us today, but could you give us a sense of over the next four to six months what your priorities are in terms of you know, getting, getting this message out or going to the Hill or talking to people about the budget and these executive orders? Like how are you, how do you want to, how are you going to fight back against those, those EOs? Well, obviously we have to, oh, the EOs are going to have to be done in court and that's going to be done by uh, AFGE National, uh, AFSCME, NTEU, I understand NEFI is going to get involved, the National Federation of Federal Employees. And, um, and that's going to grind its way through the, the court system. I think they'll be lucky if they get a, a, a stay um, of the executive orders. Um, if they don't, that's going to be tragic. If they do, that'll be great. Then we can go back and, and try to right the ship. So what's the biggest priority? is trying to uh, influence the uh, people that are in the, in, the, in the middle, the movable middle in Congress, whether it's the House or Senate, um, and uh, tell them real stories about EPA and uh, show them, number one, the good work we've done, and show them the work that can be done if we're given more money. Um, but these Unfortunately, uh, too many of our congressional representatives and senators just want to get reelected, so uh, it, things may not happen until after the election. Uh, you mean things you mean in Congress may not happen until yeah. the yeah. election. And I'm not necessarily predicting a uh, sea change in Congress. I think some people are. I think the uh, congressional districts have been gerrymandered pretty well by both parties. Um, so uh, even if, for example, the Democrats took the House, how long would they hold on to it? I don't know. Uh, in terms of the Senate, I believe that's 28 uh, Democratic seats are up for re-election, eight Republican, somewhere in that neighborhood. Well, the Democrats have to keep all their seats and then gain some. That's an uphill battle, so we don't know. So maybe Scott Pruitt should stay in office, at least until after November. I mean, what has been your like highest level of contact with the Trump administration? You haven't met with Minister Pruitt. You heard from Ryan Jackson. You heard uh, from? No, we haven't heard from Pruitt. Haven't heard from uh, Wheeler, Ryan Jackson, uh, anybody, um, even somebody at the level of uh, Donna Vizian, who's the principal deputy yeah. administrator, or whatever. Um, she tries to defer us. They just don't want to talk to unions. Yeah. So we're kind of in a litigious mode right now. Um, no, I understand that other agencies, for example, uh, uh, Social Security and others, uh, they've already received um, uh, notice that the agency wants to renegotiate the space and the official time and the disciplinary actions and all that sort of thing in their contracts. They're just going full speed ahead. I think part of it is because uh, 
people in charge don't want to lose their jobs. They'll do whatever is necessary to protect their jobs. Uh, they're not here to protect the, the worker. Uh, they're here to protect their own jobs. So that's going across the entire government, uh, agency after agency. Are you surprised with how extreme the Trump administration is, um, even more extreme than the Bush administration, or were you expecting it uh, when, when he got elected? Uh, actually, yes, I was expecting it. Um, the day after the election, I wrote to our national president, J. David Cox, and I started a series of meetings with him and his staff at National, and I informed all of our locals and stuff, and unfortunately there were a number of them that saw that said, well, we haven't seen anything in writing yet. And then, of course, in March of 2017, we saw the skinny budget, so we saw where their um, their intentions were. Uh, and we saw the, the budget for 2019. Uh, we saw a lot of indicators. Plus, you have to you know look at like the White House. Who did they have as the advisor for labor? James Shirk from the Heritage Foundation. He also advises on federal employees. We know his official, his position on official time and federal employees in general. Uh, and we know that the, the skinny budget was uh, probably 90% taken from the Heritage Foundation's suggestions. So it's to me it wasn't a surprise, but I think the three executive orders surprised a lot of the locals, a lot of the chapters within uh, AFG. Um, I'm a red place, forgive me if uh, this has already been asked, but um, you've talked about Chicago being a kind of hotspot of tension mm -hmm. uh, between the administration um, and employees. Are there any other hotspots like that? And conversely, are there um, regional offices where uh, that are more in line with what the Trump administration wants? Um, I think it all depends on, uh, the answer is yes, I mean there's uh, Chicago, uh, D.C., I hate to point these out because then I'm sure Scott Pruitt will read the article and, and say, well, let's go after them. But uh, there's a number that have uh, great courage and are going forward and trying to do something. And there are other regions um, that are basically trying to stick their head in the sand. And when you stick your hand and head in the sand, the rest of your body is still standing upright. Uh, they're going to get get treated just as poorly as we get treated. Uh, that's what they don't understand. It's going to be a nationwide thing. It's, it's not, you're not going to get rewarded for being quiet. Uh, they just don't like people that make noise because we tell them you're doing the wrong thing. You're, what you're doing is illegal. Um, you're not protecting children. You're not protecting the most vulnerable. We don't want to hear that. Uh, do you want to say which regions are on that latter category? Or? In, in which category? Uh, the ones that are sticking their heads in the sand. I haven't seen enough activity, in my opinion, out of, for example, Kansas City, or um, lately uh, Boston and New York have been kind of quiet. Um, and I think what they need to, to do is ramp up their efforts. Research Triangle Park is, uh, is our premier uh, office of research and development facility, and uh, the scientists there apparently are so scared they're, they're, they're afraid of their shadows. It's a shame, because um, their jobs are on the line. They do a lot of uh, air research in that facility. Cincinnati is another one where you, um, they don't even want to go out and do a rally outside their own building on public property. Um, I, I can't explain it. I can't explain why people are like that. Um, I, I'm not, and uh, a lot of people in other regions are not. And I believe the only way to resist is to stand up and tell the truth. If Scott Pruitt walked in here, <clears throat> excuse me, if Scott Pruitt walked in here right now and sat down and said, John, tell me what you want me to do. Are there five things you would tell him? Well, first, um, go to Congress and raise the budget. Uh, secondly, hire more people. And third, leave the agency, please. <laughs> <laughs> What about the impact of budget cuts on uh, drinking water programs, uh, lead issues, things that, you know, people, things that people really do care about in terms of being consumers? Um, lead is a, uh, a critical issue. There's about 15,000 
uh, drinking water facilities across the country. Of those, the uh, uh, various societies like the American Water Works Association have indicated that as many as 5,300 of those facilities are at or near the same place that Flint, Michigan was at, um, that they could go any time. Um, we know for a fact that in New York, Chicago, Boston, any of the older cities, lead service lines uh, were the new technology of the era 100 years ago, and they're still in place. So that potential always exists for lead contamination. And the, uh, so these other societies, uh, the American Society of Civil Engineers, tells us we really need billions of dollars to put into infrastructure. Uh, not only new drinking water facilities and new wastewater treatment plants, because they're at or near their life expectancy, but the service lines going from the drinking water plant to the houses. Um, also the, uh, the sewer lines, for example, there's infiltration info issues there, and uh, they, they need to address that. They need to put more money into it. They're not putting half as much as they should. And cutting a budget means that fewer of these uh, service lines and drinking water facilities will be maintained or built. There'll be fewer inspections, um, so we'll have less knowledge about them. There'll be uh, fewer uh, municipalities that address the problem because they don't have the funding. Uh, they rely on federal funding, uh, uh, loans that uh, they can get at a low interest rate uh, in order to do that work. And it's good work because it puts people to work, right? They pay taxes, so it, it's, it's a win-win for everyone and you improve public health. Region 5 was uh, at about um, 1,250 employees uh, in the past years. It's down to just slightly over 1,000 employees. Uh, the number of managers has stayed essentially the same. Why? I don't know. Um, I mean, if there's fewer people to manage, why are there still the same number of managers? Um, but um, uh, there's at least 100 positions that are uh, vacant right now. The agency indicates on its most recent uh, advice of expenditures that um, Are you? they're expecting zero attrition, which is false. They're going to have uh, a lot of people leaving, and they're expecting zero um, hires. So they've come out and said zero hires. Uh, we did have a congressional group of uh, like Jan Schakowsky, Bill Foster, uh, Mike Quigley, and I forget who else, came in and spoke specifically to Kathy Steff about this and she assured them that they would uh, look at this vigorously, but they haven't hired anybody. Are we good? I think so. Thank you very much. Well, thanks very much. Great questions. Thank you for taking the time. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you.